Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to today's episode. All right. The title of today's episode is an important one. It is titled The Comfort of Your Seat in Existence. There has been many other episodes, not many, but I think a few other episodes where I brought up this concept that our existence, our experience of our existence is like a chair we're sitting in. And so I have in some sense compared the idea of the DNA with the idea of the chair that we find our sight on. I wanted to, in this episode, a bit more deeply, talk about how we as human beings have to accept our perception And in order to accept our perception, we are, it's another way of saying we're accepting the world we have access to. Right now as I'm speaking, I do have a comfort with my seat in existence. I know that uh, this seat I'm in is I will not always be sitting in my uh, physical life. And I know that when a person sits on a chair, there are two forces that motivate the moment. Either the person gets up themselves where this is recommended, they call this self-enlightenment, you know, or the person is pulled by some force from the chair. You know, there is also something in this life that it's such a giant event, just the event of life, being alive. It's such a giant thing, and we find ourselves part of this giant system <coughs> that when I honestly, honestly, when I look at it, I know that many people are starting from their inner universes, and there is a vast amount of the population in some sense sidelined, if I can say that. And what that means is we have been incapable, incapable so far as a species to, be, to develop an advanced civilization where everybody's value in some sense can uh, come to the center of the stage. <clears throat> we have built a world that it, it is easy not to care for other human beings. And, and this is a very big error. This is the, one of the biggest errors in human thought. You know, when I was younger, I remember um, my aunt was living in Hamburg in Germany and uh, <clears throat> my parents, um, when I was very young, my parents had taken me to see my aunt and I had a certain impression of her. Then years later, years later, I think maybe six years later, the, my family went to see my aunt <clears throat> and all the images I had my, of my aunt was from that previous six years. It was as if the image, the idea of who my aunt was to me had not changed in that six years. And I realized that we are keeping people in our minds in a certain way. <clears throat> and this is very important because the moment we forget that we are human beings that change, we start treating each other like statues and for a moment our humanism gets lost. You know? So, regardless of how people are seated in manifestation as an intelligent activity, we have to be conscious that our inner realms also does not uh, fixate on the chair they're sitting on. 
<clears throat> there's a saying which is incredible. I honestly wished I had heard it earlier. Uh, in this lifetime, the quote says, um, yesterday's enemy is tomorrow's friend. Yesterday's enemy is tomorrow's friend, meaning that if we, if a human being has an experience, <clears throat> and in this experience, the human being identifies an archetype or in some sense sculpts a person into a certain archetype of their own past and mind, that archetype is not absolute. And what I mean by that is, in a changing universe, what can be absolute, really? <clears throat> Aside from the idea of change, everything else is changing. You know, the comfort of our seat in existence means <clears throat> how much uh, attributeless consciousness can uh, witness, uh, can watch the moment without changing it. You know, there's moments in life where one will feel alone. They will feel alone, <clears throat> not externally, but internally. They will feel, in some sense, their inner realms is like an event taking place that no one else other than them can see. And we may wonder, oh universe, why have you designed an entity? Why have you brought forth the geometry of a creature? <clears throat> in which its eyes, in some sense, are one-sided. Uh, excuse me, not one-sided, but the eyes of the human being look outward. It's as if, based on our biological design, we are not meant to look behind our eyes. We are meant to look in front of them. Do you see? It's like it's part of the geometry of nature that we are. When we look outward, there is form. When we look inward, there is the one observing the form. You know, uh, <clears throat> what I'm really, like what's in my heart for this episode is that I see 8 billion human beings, each in the seat, each seated in their DNA, in their unique perception of the world. <clears throat> and I am asking myself, there's 8 billion inner universes approaching the outer and how many of these inner universes are actually being engaged how much for like like how much does the outer world care for eight billion simulated dimensions of itself and it is the most important information that means there is an information that in, in that we can say it's sensory perception that from the outer realms through <coughs> light being the smallest energy carrier system light transports perception into our eyes this perception enters the inner realm and in the inner realm it is in some sense left there really sometimes <clears throat> when I look at things anew, it's kind of like my mind is a garage and a new vehicle has entered and it's like a bunch of mechanics, imagine, you know, a car comes into the mechanic shop and they just look around the car trying to figure it out, you know, figure out what's wrong with it. You know, sometimes I feel there's an inner space and outer phenomenology, especially geometry, <clears throat> color and, and depth and space, which I'll get into later. These find themselves within the person's psyche. 
and the concept of the psyche this is the most hilarious thing psychology is one of the most uh, <clears throat> loudest voices um, after the scientific method I would say that is dismissing the idea of the soul but the concept of psychology began because people were like what's moving the human body and that went to the depth of the mystery of the you know hidden inspiration of the future <clears throat> and I feel that we are inspired by two worlds like right now this episode this episode is really inspired by my inner realms. I mean I am seeing the outer realms I am seated in the outer realms I am embodied but the attention how the attention engages the moment it's like my mind is moving in two rooms a room behind my eyes and that room overlays upon physical reality and a room in front of my eyes where that room is just there and that means physical reality existence is kind of like imagination you don't have to imagine <clears throat> it is given imagination if you uh, identify as a subject or in some sense it is fixed reality <clears throat> metaphysics is such an important branch of psychology that when a person realizes what human beings are doing on this planet they will gain a respect for what language is doing on this planet language is really how the inner realm and the outer realms are bridged that means really what are the ways of communication you know we have body language that is a way we bridge the inner realms that means someone's uncomfortable you know <clears throat> they they say something Right? So they make their inner realms, they make the outer realms aware of their inner realms. Somebody who stands up for themselves, they make the outer realms aware of their inner realms. Somebody at a job interview, they make <coughs> their inner realms very clear to the employer. You know, they make the employer realize, all right, this is how I'm looking at your world, you know, that I'm stepping in. So really, human beings, we have been in the, poetically, in the business of... Uh, teleporting we have been moving actually back and forth <clears throat> between an invisible portal a portal that it's between the visible and invisible it is our eyes most beings are seated in some sort of conditional perception conditional means that if the circumstances of the world in front of you in front of your eyes changes <clears throat> it changes the possibilities accessible behind your eyes if you like I personally went for three uh, I think it was like exactly three days without eating and it wasn't an intentional fast and of course there's people in the world where I saw this documentary that children in some countries they're like skin to the bone right and people don't realize that when when a person gets super skinny they actually temperature becomes harsher on them and pressure becomes harsher on them right <clears throat> hundred percent in the future we will have um, incredible kind of health suits for like for example anorexic people and whatnot there's a lot of ways where intelligence is moving <clears throat> And um, I remember that, um, unfortunately, due to that uh, tough time of my life where there was a sort of mismanagement of my own resources, I found myself uh, observing my own psychology when, three, when in three days, like, the person doesn't eat, you know. <clears throat> and what tends to happen is that the body temperature really falls down. You start getting very cold quicker. Then after the second, the second day, you're still enduring it, enduring it. It's like narratives and stories are in the mind. The third day, the body starts crying out which means it's like sensation-based things, you know? And many people don't realize that <clears throat> we have built a society where there's classes in it, and there are classes of people. <clears throat> For example, I see this in downtown Toronto. There's a lot of um, <clears throat> what is classified as the homeless population. It's in some sense has nothing to do with the psychology. It's the lack of humanism and the lack of nutrition that can imbalance a person's psychology. So in some sense, what I mean is because we are a <clears throat> neurochemical animal, you know, because the content of our body matters in regards to how we are seated in our body. The eyes are like the source of life we really need for, for the modern man. And our eyes are not just external, they are internal. That means somebody can see reality, then they can close their eyes and reality can still move behind their eyes.
And you know, imagine we're seated on a revolving chair. A chair that is, even though it is one chair in one position on the space-time continuum, it revolves. And it revolves between an inner dimension and an outer dimension. Anytime we look at the inner dimension, we are watching life as a movie. <clears throat> you know, we are the watcher of the movie. You know, it, when one closes their eyes, you know, you don't know how many, it's hilarious, how many schools of thought on this planet, when it has come to uh, try to contemplate the mind, they've perceived it as an image generator. <clears throat> the mind is pretty much like, you know, uh, works for like the cinema industry. <laughs> You know, you're, the person has cr a crazy imaginative vision and they're like, oh my God, you know, is my uh, imagination being produced, you know, by Hollywood, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> Our minds are incredible tools, you know, and if we don't use them, we commit a grave error, not a sin, an error, you know, an error means misuse. Anytime somebody does something wrong on the computer, the computer lets the person know, buddy, you made an error. Do you see this screen? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody is on their own chair in existence, and we're not stuck on this chair. I mean, in regards to the biology, sure. The biology, like, my, I treat my body as an airplane. <laughs> I treat, like, honestly, the moment I wake up in the morning, you know, I mean, I'm <clears throat> kind of giggling now, but <laughs> how I perceive it is really, I, I went, okay, so I'll tell you, in the beginning of my life, when I was young, I was a person. <clears throat> Now, I have reached a point in this lifetime that whatever happens, I know that I am a presence. And presence is unconditional energy and attention instantaneous. That awareness is very crucial in this life. Whoever you are, whatever you're doing, uh, you know, and especially if you're an older person hearing me right now. If you're someone who's above your 50s. It is so important that you, you probably are, I mean, people above their 50s, they've seen enough of life to be grounded in their presence. But there's a lot of people who they cannot accept reality, so they do not become grounded in their presence. And to become grounded in your presence means to accept energy before shape. That means we're all an energetic phenomenon. Right, my energy is actually non-local. Energy doesn't have a location because if it did, we can't consider energy being able to be <clears throat> immortal. Right, energy is an immortal concept. It cannot be created or destroyed, but it transforms. Right. So energy is going through immortal transformation. You know, or the periodic table is going through immortal reincarnation. And it's as if the elemental realm is trying to access something, you know? It's as if our cells, even if we had ideologies or not, the biology cells know. You know, the biology of the human being is, is, is in some sense like, <clears throat> you know, a prepaid program poetically for a multidimensional being. We have entered reality. And this means we have entered a uh, direct experiential change. <clears throat> and I feel there's no superior teaching pretty much in all these talks I've given throughout the years. I am just taking people to the edge of the language threshold, then poetically piloting back down, you know. So you can say in these podcasts, if, if everybody's conversation or any time a human being communicates, it's a level of jumping. It's like I'm trying to jump as far as I can into the sky and then automatically the gravity of human psychology due to the conditioned normality of 2021. It's like we go, we go towards the multidimensional, then we realize, all right, for how long are we going to be a multidimensional being, you know? <clears throat> Many people in metaphysical teachings they consider that they are temporary and they're going to become eternal. They're like, yeah, if I do the, if I play my cards right, you know, I'll be an eternal being soon, you know. <clears throat> I'll go into this sort of afterlife that in some sense nothing is dismissed of my of the person's let's say eternal value. <clears throat> but in some sense 
I would say the transcendental entity exists to the imagination. So it's another way of saying like our physical body is in one dimension, our mind is in multiple dimensions, and the soul, which is the space where the body and mind is happening, <coughs> is dimensionless. That means there's a, there's a quality to consciousness that it's like we cannot define the actor uh, excuse me, we cannot say the actor on stage in the spotlight is the spotlight. And our awareness... ...is the spotlight where the idea of our human life is dwelling in. Sorry guys, this was on mute and I was talking. Um, so, welcome everyone in the chat section. Feel free to ask any question. These live streams happen once. I mean, honestly, what can I say? We are a sensory entity and how we receive the world becomes our chair. <clears throat> I, talk, uh, I talk about the pilots of consciousness, this term I coined. And I feel that we are all sitting on a pilot's chair. We're all seated in an intelligent position which we can direct. Now, the human being, we can say, has been commanded by the laws of nature or has been sculpted <clears throat> by the forces of nature. For now, in scientific circles, there are the four major forces, right? Gravitational, electromagnetic, strong nuclear, weak nuclear. These four forces are kind of like poetically the four <coughs> um, you know, the, they are the edges of, they are the edges of the hand of the sculptor of phenomenology from a scientific view. But what it is, is that the forces of nature, whatever way we fathom them, are shaping us. You know, the temperature right now of where I'm seated is affecting me. You know, the color of the scenery I'm seeing is affecting me. You know, the stare of my neighbors from across my building <laughs> is affecting me. You know, <laughs> and yet, if I don't do anything in this life, I come down, I come automatically to the pilot. That means there are some people on this planet that they implement a very unique strategy to their life. <clears throat> and that strategy is, is trying to figure out what they are before they die. <laughs> <clears throat> 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 
what we are for now is free will that is owning an idea. This is invalid. But we can't say that in modern society because everything's based on individualism. So we have to, <clears throat> you know what it is? It's as if we're like on a chair, but the chair is on one of those horizontal escalators, you know? And so even though the chair is not moving, the world is moving with a certain narrative, with a certain psychology. <clears throat> Anytime I personally step into society, I treat society as a machine. <clears throat> even though I talk about an advanced civilization being way more intelligent than what, what we see now, Civilization 1.0 to me is like a paper shredder. Or it, you can say it's like some sort of machine that has no sensitivity for the inner constitution of the human being. And when I say the inner constitution, I'm not talking about the rights and freedoms, universal human rights that we have to express ourselves. I'm talking about that everybody, there's a saying that says everybody is fighting a battle you cannot see. What that means is everybody, <clears throat> let's, let's for a second actually consider that there's two chairs we're sitting on. Okay, one chair is the outer realm biological existence. Everybody can go in the mirror and accept this chair they're sitting on. <clears throat> then there is the chair of one psychology. You know, how the psyche animates. Or in some sense, how intelligence rooted in the unknown gives fruits of knowledge. You know, there is a theory, for example, in the theological view. I shouldn't say there's a theory, but in, in theology, there's this notion that Adam what's like the father of mankind when it comes to human form and of course God is the father of the universe <clears throat> but it's as if the theory is that <clears throat> the idea of man is still the mind of God so you can say right now I can envision in my inner realms just any this is a good exercise so any, every, anybody listening there's four viewers just for a moment, wherever you are, you could be doing anything or whatever, just close your eyes for a moment, and in your inner realms, <clears throat> imagine like an, uh, imagine Iron Man walking in midair, or something, right? Imagine some character, right? Now imagine, your eyes are closed, you're imagining, visualizing this character, now imagine that character in your imagination realizes you are imagining it. So imagine your imagination suddenly becomes conscious and it's like, yo, did you just imagine me right now? You know? Internally, people can be in sit seated on chairs that have a very tragic view of the world. You know, I'll be honest, I've been shocked so far in this lifetime. I've maybe spoken to three people who they've hated the world. They've actually hated the system, right? And it's so easy to hate something. It's easier than liking it. You know, liking takes effort. Hating something instant. You know, a person can instantly reduce someone's value to nothing. Do you know? <clears throat> instantly we can dislike hate and render things empty which is the easiest it is the easiest strategy you know the person's like i got karma all right i'm gonna be emptiness you know now i don't got you know i don't have any karma because where would the karma be you know <laughs> <clears throat> so The value of the chairs that we are on, and of course I can even make this idea more complex and say that the, these chairs, so it's like one chair which is existence, then it becomes two chairs where it is experience of existence, then it becomes multiple experiences of a singular existence, then it becomes a singular experience of multiple existences, then it becomes multiple experiences of multiple existences. We haven't gotten there. I feel we will, but I don't know now, maybe maybe when cyber collective minds emerge, or maybe if people go back to nature and touch trees, they will realize that there's something in nature which is rhythmic. 
<coughs> and the rhythm of one soul is like their their destiny, believe it or not. So it's really it's not what you do in this life; it is what uh, wave you are surfing. Sadhguru is a very uh, very unique figure, you know, in our history currently. <coughs> and Sadhguru, um, I remember hearing in one of his lectures saying something that it's not about you doing something that feels right or wrong. It's about you doing the right thing. And what that means is it's kind of like the Rubik's Cube, where there's a certain algorithm into solving it. And when we look at the concept of, you know, the enhancement of the vision of the human being beyond absolutist images towards a direct experiential and infinitely changing movie, right, we will be seated more in, I would say, a sort of liquid state of mind than a solid fixated reality. Right, because it is easy to shape. You see, it, there is this concept in filmmaking. You know, they ask, "What's his name?" Oh my God, what's his name? Uh, I think his name is Hancock. Uh, I forget his. Uh... Oh, sorry, sorry, not Hancock. <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock. There we go. <laughs> you know, some of my uh, film pr film production professors are screaming right now. You know. <laughs> But Alfred Hitchcock, you know, they asked him, what is editing, sir? And he was like, editing is cutting. You know, his accent's very, you know, English, heavy English accent. You know, he's like, it's cutting. And what, <laughs> and what it means is you record footage, you get raw footage like a sculptor putting a giant stone, and then the editor sculpts this footage. Do you, so, do you see what I mean? And so in this life, we gain an experience and based on our memory and our ability in our inner realms, we sculpt that experience. So we are actually sculpting our chair in life or it's another way of saying every, every time the moment changes, so does your mind. That means right now that I'm saying these words, my mind is different than it was a second ago where I was saying different words. That tension is, is shifting. And I don't know what other greater resolution we can have. It's like it's like a giant Star Trek crew, but the Star Trek crew is on a rock in the middle of nowhere. And so at some point when there's dynamism and movement, the members of the starship have to just get on the, sit on their chairs and just fasten their seats or <clears throat> have so, some sort of gravitational seat belt or whatever. And you know, I personally feel there is um, <clears throat> life right now, the way we have um, structured human civilization, it's honestly like a soccer game. It's like a football game. Why? Because <clears throat> not everybody is engaged in the advancement of civilization. And in some sense, there is just like, let's say certain authorities, like the leaders of nations playing uh, <clears throat> the soccer game. <clears throat> and everybody else in the world is like a bystander. We're like looking at looking at uh, you know reality happen from the stands. Now there are some people who take reality seriously and go become a part of its history. You know, it's like a privilege to be a historic animal. By the way, many people don't consider this. <clears throat> you know, many people in the New Age community evidently they're in uh, they're content with emptiness. You know, it's like this idea where somebody says, I am the most loving person in the world, but then that person, somebody is suffering in front of them and they're not helping, right? So in some sense, to me, all those people who feel they're enlightened on the planet, who are not serving the advancement of civilization, it's like you are loving yourself more than your world, so you're trying to transcend your world through self-love, but that is not the proper strategy. You know, the proper strategy, and of course there's different schools of thought, you know, some yogis could be hearing me right now and be like, Mr. Within, are you telling people to uh, engage in samsara longer? <clears throat> and I'm just saying, enlightenment is in the inner realms, it can happen anytime. It can happen in the middle of building an advanced civilization. It can happen in any moment because the mind is generating the concept of time. And when one gets to that level of observance where they notice how time is taking shape in accordance to the whims of their attention, then reality changes, you know. Then there is a, what I would say a great 
neutral moment that you will find yourself as a human being after any ideological enlightenment uh, <clears throat> system has finished. Because I'll tell you, there is something such uh, karma is ha is real, but it is real in the sense that we started. And karma is such an important idea, especially for anyone interested in mysticism. Why? Because karma, similar to, I believe, the third law <coughs> uh, of thermodynamics, in some sense, there is a sort of cause and effect going on. So if we right now, if right now who I am giving this talk. It's my karma based on how I have lived in other moments in the space-time continuum. I, I have found myself uh, stationed in this kind of chair of existence now giving this podcast. <clears throat> it's as if I am uh, the cause of my effect in this life. Okay? That's really the value. Or the, excuse me. This, that's really the value of the free will. It is causal. It causes things. And if a person, just the idea of karma, if we just have this notion we're in a cycle of karma, and the karma is the effect of a cause, we are the cause. So unless the person realizes that they have stepped into this universe, they will not be free. It will all be theatrics. <clears throat> you know. Because fear is real, right? Yeah, a person can be like, I've attained supreme bliss, buddy. You know, don't mind me. You know, <laughs> but I'm I'm telling you, I experienced something close to a near death internal experience, an inner near death experience, and in that inner near death experience, it was a moment where the body expre experiences a complete loneliness, a loneliness that nothing has compares to it. Right? And in that loneliness, from that state of loneliness, there comes a regret. And that regret becomes the attachment to reincarnate as a human being again. Right? So we have to build a system that is so efficient that we don't regret the lives we live. We are rather energized by our activities. Right? <clears throat> so I'm pretty much telling the whole mystical audience of the world, hey, Let's build an advanced civilization, then become the sky. Because whatever we do, as long as we are an individual body, a person is attached. It's impossible is looking at a worldhood. When the soul looks at the world, it cannot just be the soul. It is the soul of the world at best. So I would say being conscious that there is an intelligent, rhythmic evolution in reality consciousness is a divine opportunity it is not just divine that we're here and eyes are moving you know there's sights roaming the space time continuum intelligently that's not just the only thing that's divine it's a divine opportunity in the sense that when else like when i fathom i'm like okay before my earliest memory i didn't exist <laughs> you know <clears throat> And at some point in this life, I will stop existing. So the norm of reality is actually non-existence. Because not not existing is the most normal thing ever. It is like uh, we have we have way more experience as non-existence than as an existential creature. The person's like I have as much non-existential experience as the beginning of the universe. You know. <laughs> <clears throat> You know, can you imagine being proud of not existing? You know? <laughs> <clears throat> but existentially, we've been here for a little while, you know, so we have way more experience not being anything than being anything. If there was awareness unconditional to format, to any sort of life format, life form, you know, this. <laughs> And uh, survival is really trying to find the comfort of our chair. Sometimes in survival, I would say a person has to maybe forced by necessity to get off a chair, right? <clears throat> you know, it's like, a, it's like a bird sitting on a tree. If there is no predator nearby, the bird's just going to keep sitting on the tree, you know, standing on the tree branch. <clears throat> but the moment there is, there is a challenge or some sort of 
you know, intense emergency level incident, then the person suddenly gets off their chair. You know, it's like even the most laziest people in an earthquake run out of the building. You know what I mean? That means it's the intensity of direct experience that suggests the intensity of the human resolve to how it questions the, its realm. You know, yesterday I gave a episode, I shared a talk on geometry in the inner realms. <clears throat> I would say the shape of existence is like the shape of the chair, but through Aristotelian thought, it's as if different causal qualities can be the meaning of uh, thingness. <clears throat> so what that means is, let's say you're sitting on a chair, and even though I'm using the chair as a metaphor for the DNA, as if we're seated experientially, in an, we are seated in a, through an unknown experiential way in, an, in a known experiential position. It's also this analogy of we're seated on a chair, but then we're called by something throughout the day. I feel, you know, there's this idea, some people say, I found my calling in life. <clears throat> you know, imagine somebody called them and gave them an opportunity. <laughs> <clears throat> but imagine that one's calling every day has its own calling. Every day, the voice of the soul of the world, the logos, engages the mind of the person. It's just how much they're willing to listen, you know? I was talking to a friend yesterday. She found herself in a scenario where her bike, um, one of the wheels of her bike kind of went flat. And she had to go to a mechanic and she went to this mechanic and the mechanic helped her out right and she left and she was telling me about it and I just thought for a moment as if her, the, when she got off her chair it caused others to get off her get, get off their chair right it gave purpose to reality <clears throat> so it's this hilarious scenario where if we do nothing as creatures on a rock in the middle of nowhere of course reality has no meaning when you do nothing you know but if you do something we create uh, momentum we create movement it's like suddenly something started to move on the surface of this rock right and that intelligent activity calls upon others right <clears throat> because there is this notion this uh, concept in business where a lot of people get into business at least those of kind heart not because of self like defense the self financial defense but they get into it <clears throat> in the sense of um, uh, what was the idea I was sharing Oh yeah, they get into it in the sense of wanting to create jobs. And if you think about what kind of jobs will there be in the future, what kind of jobs can we create for the human being that give the human being purpose, what's going to happen is a lot of labor jobs, probably getting close to the year 2050 <clears throat> and beyond, will become automated. So in the future, the, the, what will be the, of most value is novelty. Right, so we want new people on this earth rather than very nice, polite people that are acting exactly like the past, or you know, uh, artificially loud people who are like just being in the present without a care for the past or the future. You know, to, <coughs> to be just in the here and now means to ignore how time is being experienced. Anytime somebody steps out of the room of time, their suffering stops, you know, because they have no past to compare the present to. It's as if the past and future are qualities of the present, projections of the present, right? So I thought, what would be the greatest purpose-giving concept to uh, 8 billion creatures roaming, just moving on the surface of a sphere, realistically in the middle of nowhere i mean come on we we created language we put everything in language and then acted as if language was reality like that's what's going on on this planet 
This is why I'm like the educational system may experience an apocalypse in the future, <clears throat> an ideological apocalypse, and I'm trying to somehow, uh, through my uh, work here in this podcast, trying to counter that in the sense of trying to make it make the surprise less extreme. Because when the human being realizes that we don't have thoughts, we receive them, or another way of saying it is we simulate them. It's as if we simulate the reception of thought through senses, right? <clears throat> that simulation is in emptiness, right? So every human being needs to have a relationship with emptiness, regardless even if it renders life meaningless, but we need to have a relationship with it. Like my relationship with emptiness is that every day I wake up in the morning, I'm like, no way, another day, you know? <laughs> It's like, it's like more, there is more to life. You know, it's like you sleep and you're like, okay, I, I experienced existence enough. Then you wake up the next day and you're like, oh my God, you know, uh, existence is giving me VIP service of, con a VIP service of consciousness. You know? <laughs> and don't forget guys, because we have, you know, a couple pound brain, Everybody is inevitably a fool when the context gets bigger, right? So there is no truth game like whack-a-mole of truth when you see the mole, you whack it, you know, thinking that you're winning truth. You know, truth cannot be won. Truth can be declared by winners. Like there has been so many people, uh, em emperors in history that they've conquered and they've made whatever they've conquered uh, their own reality, right? So it's pretty much like people of different power, they have different influence, right? They, we say uh, like what's it called, POI, person of influence, right? In certain companies, they acknowledge this. Now influence, what is the, what is the influence? How can a person have an influence? And the influence is how much their inner realms in some sense is relatable to the outer realms. That means there's a dimension where two people talk and they share ideas. Then there's a dimension where people share their ideas, but they're not just sharing it between each other. They're sharing it in a world. And so the only way we as human beings have sophisticated conversations is that through our veil of ignorance, we individualize in our own inner realities. And because our inner realities are not connected, we have a reason to explore the world. If all of our minds, let's say in the future, were connected to one computer, there would be no reason for speech. That means we have to be very careful going into the future as the human species that if we develop collective uh, minds, whether through cyberspace, through nature, it's, it's, it's manageable. But through collective mindhood, through cyberspace, I don't think it's manageable. I think it's going to be devastating. <clears throat> so collective cyberspace would mean an era of silent humanism or would be an era where there's no need to speak because your thoughts are already accessible by the other person's mind. So we have to be very uh, happy that in some sense we, there is no telepathy yet because if there was telepathy, there would be no humanism. There would be no need to be a human if you're one giant being, right? So there is this thing that if the drop falls into the ocean, the ocean is the supreme reality. But if the drop is, falls onto a leaf, the drop is the superior reality. We have right now civilization is like a leaf, so we feel like a drop on it. We feel like an individual. We value... We, <laughs> we value the individual and we value... the sovereignty of the inner universe of the person, right? <clears throat> because the only reason I feel people are even listening to this podcast I'm giving is because by the nature of my DNA being different from everyone else, when I share what I see, it is different. So in some sense, when human beings communicate and they advance communication, for the first time, the human being understands it is not its expression. So you, people might not believe, but in all these years that I've been giving these talks, I've actually been walking beyond every ideology I have talked, talked about. Why? Because if I don't accept the containment of thought, if I don't see a geometry to, to the inner realms, it's as if the inner realms, there's nothing the free will can do, right? Because movement is shape-oriented. <clears throat> the shape of your world view is the shape of your view of the world, you know, of how you're in the world as a person.
if a person feels they are unlucky, the universe is going to be like, all right, this human being feels unlucky. Let's let's let let him walk into that world. If a person feels lucky, the universe is like, oh my God, a human being feels he, they're lucky. This is a rare sight, and the universe uh, imagine the spirit of, you know, karma's goodness helps us. You know? <laughs> there has been times, guys, where in my inner realms, I've had poetic conversations with the logos. <clears throat> and usually my response to it is me shouting at the sky as if for a second considering that there's multiple dimensions and the human intelligence is visible. When I say we're an antenna, in some sense we can provide a signal as much as receiving one. And when we treat human intelligence like a satellite, like all our GPS systems right now, how are they functioning? The satellite is in the orbit of our planet <clears throat> and <clears throat> it is recording pictures. We access the satellite's point of view and then we know what, how to coordinate in our individual realm, right? So beyond orbit, <clears throat> we, um, we use the information of, of our site to, <clears throat> you know, pinpoint our destinations and, you know, to pretty much have GPS technology. Now I'm saying let's take this in through let's take this metaphor of the satellite through a metaphysical context and it's as if while we're being an individual human that is looking trying to find a GPS system <clears throat> and let's say the GPS system is intuition that GPS system is like a satellite but not beyond the orbit in another dimension. Do you see what I mean? We are receiving information from a non-local state that is just pure being. It's a field, right? That's what I meant in uh, collective, uh, an introduction of an individuals to, to the collective through nature is manageable, but through cyberspace it's not. Through cyberspace, I mean, people have to realize um, if everybody had every information, there would be no reason for individualism again. Right, so the aim of life is not to get as much information as possible because you think that's the best strategy. The aim of life is that the information is directly being experienced. <clears throat> and it's like noticing, being like, okay, so I'm a conscious being right now. I'm aware that I'm aware, but what's up with this? And that curiosity will lead you in recognizing all the ways all the different types of Iron Man suits and memories that tension has instantly and instantaneously been in. Right? Like when I think about this life, if I was to explain my outer life, yeah, it was, you know, outer life is kind of like a curved line going straight, <clears throat> you know, going up. But um, it's one of those curved graphs, you know, bell graphs. I shouldn't say bell, but imagine like half of the bell graph, you know. But I would say in my inner realms, it has been zigzag all the way. You know, there's been days where I have teleported my attention to my own suffering and I've walked in my own hell. There's been days where I've teleported my attention out of my suffering in my inner realms and I've experienced the heavenly day, you know. There's been moments where things have happened that where my mind had no strategy for, right? And the only thing you can do is be a sideline witness. <laughs> <clears throat> that means it's pretty much if the free will can do something, you know, you're the driver of the moment. If the free will can't do anything, you're the passenger of the moment, really. In the inner realms, the free will can always move. That means anything can happen to the biological body. The mind will still have its freedom of animate bodyhood. And you know how I know this? You know what the proof of this is? The proof of it, this is that when we sleep, like think about this, what is sleep? <clears throat> it is our body going into an unconscious state. Now, what happens in the deep sleep state? We have a dream. And what is a dream? A dream is your mind making a body and a world for itself when your body is actually asleep in your bed. <clears throat> so that means if the body is inactive and unconscious, the mind can still access worlds. <clears throat> this is the biggest proof that after death, the mind will still have a body but it won't be its own body. So it's as if like, <clears throat> I would say if in the theological lens we were given a clue of a sort of, uh, at least in certain Abrahamic traditions that once the person dies, they will resurrect 
uh, by by truth's calling right i would say that's another way of saying that it's like the ignorance dies and only the truth really can remain what else can remain right if we say that our individualism was the source of our suffering only when the individualism changes the suffering goes but if a person realizes that suffering source is fictitious that means of course a person can experience pain in the outer realms i'm not saying there isn't pain in like intensity in the outer realms i'm saying how, what that pain and intensity in the outer realms means is your choice and this is the difference between strong character archetypes in, on this planet and weak character archetypes. That means how far the person is willing to see turbulence but still pilot on. You know, that is really what we call hope. Uh, the continuity of intelligent and conscious effort. In the subtitle I've written DNA's terrace, I meant in the sense that DNA is a balcony, <clears throat> you know, also, and necessarily, you know, or I would say I, the reason I'm sharing this is not only because I'm sitting in a balcony right now, but really because every person's design is a, a unique access to the realm. And when we can care, <clears throat> collectively for how we access reality civilization would advance would accelerate you know that means imagine human beings right now in the type of in civilization 1.0 can't wait to go to sleep in civilization 2.0 human beings can't wait to wake up because waking up means entering the greatest game that humanity ever played the greatest event in nature is the advanced civilization it is the most advanced thing that can happen on this planet you know i'm not just saying it because it is the, it is the smartest outcome i'm saying it because it is the most beautiful work of art ever right because there's a work of art when when only one artist creates it you know and the artist is like oh my god look at this artwork i made yay and then imagine a species making an artwork Imagine the species consciously projects itself towards its advancement. Because if, if we don't uh, build an advanced civiliz civilization, what? Like the squirrels and the birds are going to build it? You know, the hypothetical aliens in our imagination are going to build it? It's, it's, it's us. We are the only ones here. We are the first ones to the scene. To the scene of the human event. I would like to go into a cold tunnel. <clears throat> of the theme of existence. I just want to share <clears throat> how people in our history have uh, looked at the concept of existence. Because that's pretty much the basic thing. That's where everybody starts. We all start off as an existential relationship. You know, we don't take care of our existence. It's like the pilot's like, oh my god, did the airplane just vanish? <laughs> By the way, uh, dear listeners, um, considering that there may be new members, uh, new listeners, um, this channel, um, <coughs> um, until the year 2022, uh, until next year pretty much, um, all the new episodes are accessible to members and there's this additional thing of these project supporter meetings where um, I, I, in some sense I will share briefings on them. Right now the member count is like... <coughs> you know, six people. Uh, beyond that, it, when it go, gets to a certain number, then the project supporter meetings, probably when there's 10 members, I'll start the project supporter meetings in regards to global initiatives that the human attention can engage with. <clears throat> but anyways, now back to the existential quote tunnel. Albert Camus.
the only way to deal with an unfree world <clears throat> is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. That's the advanced communicator, ladies and gentlemen, the human being that in some sense has realized freedom is our birthright, but the freedom of the highest multidimensional caliber. B uh, R Amb Ambit Carr says cultivation of mind should be the ultimate aim of human existence. Again, pointing to advanced communication in the inner realms. Lord Byron says man's love is of man's life apart. It is a woman's whole existence. In her first passion, a woman loves her lover. In all the others, uh, in all the others, all she loves is love. Of course, you know, the human being by the design of nature is a solitary animal, you know, is an animal that begins in solitude. Every, as the Buddha says, everybody is born alone. Like the Buddha was pretty thug. I mean, like some of his quotes are pretty gangster. <laughs> You know, Buddha said you were born alone, you die alone. And anything else in the middle of that journey is a privilege. Whether it's people, whether it's an advanced civilization, whether it's, you know, uh, the embrace of, of, of the greatness of the realm or whatever. <clears throat> Max Planck says all matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force <clears throat> we must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind this mind is the matrix of all matter and why does max planck say we must assume max planck is a very notable scientist why does he say we must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious intelligent mind you know why because if we don't assume there is nothing left to the world that means it could be the illusion of emptiness too soon. It could be that the universe is like a dark room where the light is off, and because the light is off, we think there's nothing there. That could be a possibility. <clears throat> Imagine the sun is like the lamp of a higher dimension. We're like, no way, you know, the whole room had a different lighting system. <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson question with boldness even the existence of a god because if there be one he must approve of the homage of reason than that of blindfolded fear yeah i see this this is like some, what thomas jefferson is saying here <clears throat> and i consider you know the the history of nations to be their karma and the patterns that the geometrical patterns their leaders in some sense project over the civilization <clears throat> because that is really what culture is. Cyril Con Connolly. The secret of success is to be in harmony with existence. To be always calm. <sighs> to let each wave of life wash us a little further up the shore <clears throat> <laughs> yeah that's what's up you know the unknown is is t updating us you know updating our knowledge you know who knew people thought they need to know get more information to update their knowledge you you are your knowledge updates when you reach the unknown edge of it you know, we only fully understand the sky when we meet, when we find its edge. And really, the concept of a sky doesn't exist. There is no such thing as the sky. You know, it's a, it's a man, it's, it's as much of a man-made idea as every other idea. You know, even the idea of man is man-made, which renders us as the unknown intelligent activator. Vladimir Nabokov <clears throat> The cradle rocks above an abyss and common sense tells us that our existence is but a brief crack of light between the two eternities of darkness. 
Eric Fromm, love is the only sane and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. <clears throat> Isaac Newton says, in the absence of any other proof, the thumb alone would convince me of God's existence. This is another way of saying our biology is so unique that it, there's definitely something else going on here in existence. It can't just be nothing becoming something. Nothing is like the soil and something was planted in the soil. A seed of design. A, an intelligent seed. You know, we, we could totally fathom that the sun, this is my, you know, you could say kind of futuristic uh, vision um, uh, theory on what the sun is. So I thought of like in, in the Kardashev scale, this is um, <clears throat> uh, Kardashev was a man who categorized society in three types. I'll share this with the audience. So my theory, this is Mr. Within's theory on what the sun is. Um, in accordance to the Kardashev scale, I'll find an image for this for you. There we go. So the Kardashev scale perceives three types of civilizations. <clears throat> the first type of civilization is you utilizing efficiently the resources of a planet. The type two civilization is harnessing, is utilizing the resources of the sun. And the type, th type two civilization is using the resources of the sun. The type three civilization harnesses all resources of a galaxy. Now, before I comment on the type three civilization, in accordance to the type two civilization, if we in the future became such an advanced human civilization that we were like, yo, we can use the sun now, you know, and imagine the sun was our technology. We adopted the sun of our solar system as our technology. We became that advanced of a humanity, imagine, right? Then we would have to think, what is the best way? What is the best way to uh, let's say we we also fathom that we share this idea that there's no other species on rocks in the universe and we're alone so we would be like okay how do we share the human design all over the cosmos and because light is is the smallest energy carrier system we would use the sun as a type 2 civilization to broadcast intelligent geometrical rays where these intelligent geometrical in, uh, ge uh, um, geometric uh, blueprints inside the sun upon, upon impact on the surface of planets with potentially intelligent particles activates civilization. So pretty much we become an advanced civilization and the universe becomes a self-reflection of how advanced we as the human species perceive it. You know, because any civilization that advances, in some sense, it's as if like individuals experience their individual free will, then we experience the collective free will, then we are caring about the destiny of the collective free will, right? That's when I would say you, you evolve from an individual into a universalist, a universal human being, where in some sense the concept of uh, <clears throat> language doesn't uh, blindfold ability. Please tell me this isn't on mute. Uh, yeah. There is something very cool about meditation. This was something that uh, <clears throat> I experienced um, in 2011. And I would tell you it's meeting the unknown. Not an unknown archetype. Not, a, not an intelligent shape of some sort of creature in the inner realms. It's just meeting the unknown, as simple as that statement can be shared. And meeting the unknown is something that many people are afraid of. But the mystics on this planet, especially, <clears throat> I would say the rishis and the yogis, in for, uh, excuse me, the rishis and the sufis, in the sufi way of thought, they had this notion, like many poets, uh, like, uh, like pretty much all these three poets had this one quote in common, <clears throat> this one ideology in common where Attar, of Neshapur, Hafiz of Shirazi, <coughs> Hafiz of Shiraz, and Rumi. <laughs> Rumi's just Rumi, okay? <laughs> Jalaluddin Molana Rumi. <coughs> I don't know the exact town he's from, you know. 
you know, it's like Jalal, <laughs> you know, uh, Jalaluddin Molana Rumi from the west coast of Persia, you know. <laughs> They had this idea in common <clears throat> where you need to die before you die, but it's the ego death. Consciousness is really like a bubble in the void. Anyways, back to the quote tunnel. Pam Brown, a horse is the projection of people's dreams about themselves, strong, powerful, beautiful, and has the capability of giving us escape from our mundane existence. And the horse is like, yo, human being, just leave me alone and let me eat some food, you know? <laughs> Eric Erickson says, in the social jungle of human existence, there is no feeling of being alive without a sense of identity. Yeah, and it's the, uh, you know, the people misinterpret mysticism as meaning that you got to be identityless in every moment. Not the case. It's like once you realize what you are and you can utilize it, the person fun functions under no belief, right? So like <clears throat> when somebody has driven a car for a few years, they don't have to go believe in how to drive a car. It's experientially known, right? The ability is instantaneously known, you know? <clears throat> where a person can drive without even thinking about their hands or how they're holding the steering wheel. But when you drive at first, right? Let's say you're a newbie driver, right? So when you drive at first, you're like, okay, how should my hands be? You know, how should my chair uh, position be? How should my mirrors be? You know, you're, you're really obsessed with the exact way to do something, not realizing that in nature, there is natural movement. So when you trust nature, you automatically succeed because you have trusted how the moment is moving. <clears throat> and it's not that you always succeed, but in some sense, the probabilities of your intelligence um, uh, give you different opportunities. Sometimes success is giving a question, asking a question. Sometimes success is I can, uh, giving an answer. Sometimes success is just watching the moment. <clears throat> you know how many moments where there has been conflict and I could have engaged the conflict in a very intense way, but all I've done is like let the moment pass. <clears throat> you know, like Gandalf was like, you shall not pass to the Balrog. But imagine the Balrog just wanted to get outside of the cave, uh, get outside of the cave to get some air, and Gandalf thought the Balrog was fighting them. You know? <laughs> and the Balrog's like, I just want to pass, man. Just let me pass and get out, get out of the mountain, you know. And but Gandalf's like, you shall not pass. You know, and the Balrog's like, WTF? You know, this is like Lord of the Rings animated. <laughs> We are inspired by many forces in the world, some unknown, some known. The known ones, anything we can identify, we in some sense can do anything about. A person cannot say they do not know because the mind is a container of sensory perception. Right? As long as a person has access to memories, they have access to instances of information. Right? <clears throat> And um, through na a natural rhythm, I will tell you, like, the greatest realization is you breathe the moment in and you breathe it out. It's all cyclical activity conditional to an existential opportunity to use the experience. That means it's like the, 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 you could say the early man 
uh, archetype of mankind was like, why am I existing? The modern man is like, what can I do with my existence? That's a different, <clears throat> totally different approach, you know? Or let's say somebody was like, what is the purpose of life? Or the person's like, what can I do with a purpose of life? Like, what is, what value does that give? <clears throat> and we are creatures that by design want to serve more than ourselves because that's how we feel collectively. That means there is an uh, urge of service. You could be like the most cruel and evil person, right? You could be like the most messed up kind of godfather figure, but then when you go home with your kids, you like are the nicest person to your kids, right? So the, and the human nature requires to give from itself to the world to understand that the world is there experientially, right? So that means there has to be an incredibly <clears throat> sophisticated giving and taking system of the management of an advanced civilization. That means there's gonna be human beings born and they're gonna be like, how are resources being managed on this earth? Sorry guys, this was on mute. Anyways, guys, to continue <clears throat> this podcast, um, Frederick Nietzsche says the irrationality of a thing is no argument against its existence rather than a condition of it. Sorry, guys, my attention was just caught by one of my neighbors. <clears throat> Anyways, Riss Darby says science and technology are the keys to both our longevity and our demise. Our entire existence on this planet is a double-edged sword. Jim Fowler says the continued existence of wildlife and wilderness is important to the quality of life of humans. A civilization which leaves so large a number of its participants unsatisfied <clears throat> and drives them into revolt no, neither has nor deserves the prospect of a lasting existence, uh, Sigmund Freud says this. Deepak Chopra says you and I are essentially infinite choice makers. In every moment of our existence, we are in that field of all possibilities where we have access to an infinity of choices. Benjamin Disraeli says, I have brought myself by long meditation to the conviction that a human being with a settled purpose must accomplish it, <clears throat> and that nothing can resist a will which will st uh, stake even existence upon its full fulfillment. That means what is the intensity of your effort towards advancement in this life? Leonard Nimoy says, that is the exploration that awaits you, not mapping stars and studying nebula, but charting the unknown possibilities of existence. Sorry guys, I'm getting really distracted in this episode. Uh, to keep going, <clears throat> Dmitry Mendeleev says it is the function of science to discover the existence of a general uh, reign of order in nature 
and to find the causes governing this order, and this refers in equal measure to the relations of man, social and political, and to the entire universe as a whole. Theodore W. Adorno says, not only is the self entwined in society, it owes society its existence in the most literal sense. Aristotle says the state, <clears throat> the state comes into existence for the sake of life and continues to exist for the sake of good life. That means intelligence is not here to experience <clears throat> an inferior possibility of itself. Our intelligence is here for its superior possibility. <clears throat> Charles Bukowski says censorship is the tool of those who have the need to hide actualities from themselves and from others. Their fear is only their inability to face what is real, and I can't vent any anger against them. I only feel this appalling sadness. Somewhere in their upbringing, they were shielded against the total facts of our existence. Toussaint Lou Louverture says, <clears throat> I have undertaken vengeance. I want liberty and equality to reign in Saint Dominique. I work to bring them into existence. <laughs> Unite yourselves to us, brothers, and fight with us for the same cause. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, what can creatures do? We're, we're individuals, we unite or we remain separate or we don't exist. We unite, we remain separate or don't exist. It's like a cycle, right? Our creatures are enter the world being wild, vicious animals in a forest scenario. And then there are times of history where human beings have the capability of language communication and building advanced networks of information teleportation around the world and as important information uh, opens our eyes to the nature of a multidimensional universe, we become explorers of a multidimensional universe, then the students of a blind singular dimension. Enough is enough. The world will roar at some point if we don't get our act together as the human species. <clears throat> Norman Vincent Peale says that it, the life of inner peace, being harmonious and without stress, is the easiest type of existence. Uh, one last quote from James Joyce he says <clears throat> the artist like the god of the creation remains within or behind or beyond or above his handiwork invisible refined out of existence uh, re refined out of existence indifferent pairing his fingernails <clears throat> If I was to give a comment, um, so I'll, uh, let's say I'm done with the quote tunnel. <clears throat> For the Kardashev scale, if we can collect, contain a universe, imagine we're a species, um, that we're such an intelligent activity in this world, that we manage to access, uh, our, we manage to become conscious as a galaxy to itself. <clears throat> we would then have an ability to instantaneously project consciousness wherever we want it. So you can say there is a sort of evolution into a physical being and that's it. Or we can say the physical life is as a liftoff platform and the evolution of the mind beyond superior, beyond, um, uh, the, the, beyond the epitome of our state of uh, sensory consciousness. You know, it's like beyond the animal, we're experiencing the life of a giant, more giant moments, right? So we're like a sphere around the animal, like a candle glow, where the candle's existing in its own glow. Now, th this glow, once it becomes more real than the candle, the evolution of the attention will be through the glow. That means it's, a, it's as if the person becomes, um, you know, it's, it's as if we're journeying back into the totality of the fabric of existence, you know? 
beyond the fabric of existence <clears throat> it's as if it's as if we are we are strangely you know what it is it's kind of like we are running towards the future and the future we, the past is running towards the future and the future is running towards the past and that intersection point where they both meet is the present moment <clears throat> where the inner realms is kind of like like our minds are like time travelers you know our bodies are like you know mountain climbers in the inner realms in an instant a person can have a different image a different location a different sensation you know I'll be honest guys <clears throat> there are moments I get tired of <clears throat> conception I get tired of language it's like a Tony Stark has to leave the Iron Man suit or it's gonna have like psychological effects yeah. so I feel if we human beings didn't have sleep we would be a sort of immortal insanity you know there's there's it's a good thing that every day the day restarts like that's that's such a grand privilege and it's as if we're designed to look outward at an endlessly restarting day and restarting world just think about that every day we close our eyes we wake up and world close our eyes open our eyes worldhood you know really what it is is we have been logging in to conscious sensory um, form based re reality and when we go into deep sleep we log out of it <clears throat> and there are certain yogis and in, in the yogic tradition I would say where they talk about that moment before the person falls asleep there is like an instant in that moment an instance in that moment before you fall asleep or in your, your, your bed where you, the consciousness the mind the inner realms and the outer realms can be disconnected before you enter the dream state <clears throat> when the inner and outer realms are both being watched that watcher actually is simultaneously aware of the body in the bedroom and also of, of the simulation of the dream state. That means I'm telling you, when we have a dream, it's like we're simulating a sphere and we're in that sphere. At any point, you could step out of that sphere and notice you're in the bed and you can then enter that sphere again. <clears throat> the mysteries of what goes on in our mind and in our unconscious states is, is one of the greatest things to explore as, as human beings. The honor of the life is the exploration of reality. Anyways guys, thanks for listening. Uh, I'll end the episode here. Whoever you are, be comfortable in the chair of your existence uh, and as you look at the world from the balcony of your DNA from the terrace of your DNA, you know? Look at this world and wonder what your inner realms can do for the outer realms, not what the outer realms can do for you. <laughs> for your inner realms, you know what I mean? If I, if I could make this into an important speech. <laughs> like, don't ask what you can do, you know, for the, uh, what the outer realms can do for the inner realms, but ask what the inner realms can do for the outer realms, and you'll, we'll see that through the advancement of communication, the advanced civilization has found this first. Thanks for listening, guys. Namaste.